Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. On the one hand, let me say that I'm greatly appreciative of EWTN once again, giving me this great privilege to join with you to hear a story. Tonight, we're gonna to have a returning guest. On the other hand, this is an amazing program for me. It's a funny program in a way. Our guest tonight is Father Paul Key. He's a former Presbyterian minister. And what's wild about this program is I'm sitting here across from the man who sponsored my wife and I into the church. If we were to do this program fully, Pat should be sitting there and mm -hmm. Marilyn should mm -hmm. be sitting here. But we go back 25 years and 25 years ago, I was just starting the journey to the Catholic Church. Um, I was sitting in on a class at Franciscan University, just starting the journey, listening to a theologian. And as I'm sitting there, I look across and I see somebody that's familiar and you do the same. It was like, what are you doing here? And that year you came into that's the right. church and I came into the church, but I don't think 25 years ago, we would have ever dreamed that not only would I be doing a, a Catholic television program mm -hmm. for 20 years, mm -hmm. but that you'd be sitting here as a Catholic priest. Yeah. Our really? Lord has an amazing sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> he sure does. It's good to be with you, Marcus. Father Paul Key. <clears throat> what a great joy and privilege to have you here, Paul. Uh, you were on the journey home uh, back in... 98. 98, fact, twice in that year. Mm -hmm. So it's been almost 20 years yep. since you've been on the program itself, yeah. right? Right. You were in the second year of the program. Yeah. So, And now you're down at Tyler, Texas. Diocesan priest in the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. That's right. What I'd like you to do, since you're a returning guest, is I'm going to invite you to give a summary of your journey into the church. And then I also want us to talk about your call to priesthood. And then we'll talk about a few other things. So, Paul, I'll let you have the floor, sure. my friend. Well, thank you. I, the journey into the Catholic Church really started when I was a Presbyterian missionary in Caracas, Venezuela. And I related to a group of St. Edmundite priests. <laughs> we worked together. And one time, Father Lawrence looked at me and said, if I ever saw anybody who had a vocation, it would be you. <laughs> I barely understood the language. <laughs> right. But I, had, I knew it had something to do with serving God. And then I came back, and I felt ready to get married, and I went to a special program. And I met my wife, Patricia, who was Catholic, chasing three other women. And I thought Patricia was off bounds because she was Catholic. God made really clear she was the one I should be paying attention to. <laughs> And so we got married, and I decided since we were uh, going to get married and I was going to become a Presbyterian minister, we'd better both go to seminary. So I took her to McCormick Theological Seminary, and, where she enrolled as a regular student of religion, same courses. And uh, she could memorize Greek and Hebrew vocabulary twice as fast as I could, so I started learning humility. <laughs> but we also started a very substantial dialogue. I mean, I was very proud to be Presbyterian. Yeah. I'm you not sure. Your dad had been. My dad is Presbyterian minister and he was active in ministry until he was 80 years old. Hmm. Um, but I proceeded to become ordained as a Presbyterian minister with a Catholic wife. She learned how to speak Presbyterian at the seminary so she could teach in the Presbyterian church and she also taught in the Catholic church and ended up being a teacher in the Catholic school. And I was a Presbyterian minister for 19 years. A lot of reading of the Bible. We are, the Presbyterian Church recommended the use of the New Vatican Lectionary, which made me study passages I'm sure I wouldn't have studied. Right, right, but I right. kept finding these passages that looked awfully Catholic. <laughs> and I kept writing them down and filing them away and putting them in a note, in a file card. When it got to 20, I knew I was in trouble. When I got to 30, with Scott Hahn's help, I figured if I'm going to make a move to where I think truth really is, and, and so at age 47 I decided I had to convert. Went to Franciscan University because I'd had a previous experience there. I, I think the Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio yeah. is just one of the lovely Catholic locations. Yeah. Went there, took RCIA, converted, then my spiritual director said, "You because he was always guiding me to be a priest. Hmm. Seven years before I converted, were you yourself thinking of it at that point? Uh, no, I was not. A, well, uh, at that point, when right. I converted, I was. Yeah. But seven years before I converted, this Jesuit priest who was giving us counsel in our marriage, third time I meet with him, says, Paul, you need to become a Catholic priest. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. I want to keep my wife. And he told me about the pastoral provision, right. at which point the possibility entered my mind. 
Uh, I was ordained in 74, really became evangelical Protestant in 79, realized that the denomination I was in was going in a bit too liberal a direction, so I was looking for options. Mm -hmm. Went to the Bible conference at Steubenville, Ohio in 82, realized I was really Catholic in theology by 84. He tells me, you ought to become a Catholic priest in 85. Yeah. But I hung back for several reasons, just hesitating until 92. Actually, 91, I made the decision with Scott Hahn's help again. I found his, uh, his tapes and his presentation, especially of biblical themes, very powerful. I think they particularly speak to us with a Calvinist Presbyterian background. Oh, because yeah. I mean, we really are committed to being biblical. Yeah. And how embarrassing it was to find out the Catholic Church is the truly biblical church. And I don't lose that argument when I discuss it. <laughs> and so in uh, 92, I actually, the uh, Easter of 92, uh, I became Catholic. My younger son became Catholic. The older son thought about it but wanted to wait. And so I became Catholic and then my spiritual director sent me to Belgium to study. I have a licentiate in sacred theology. Uh, from the uh, Institute of Theological Studies, l'Institut d'Etudes Theologiques in Brussels, which was a great experience in Europe for five years off and on. Oh yeah, wow. And then I came back and I worked in the Diocese of Lubbock for five years as a layman. Mm -hmm. When I got back, I realized I needed my Spanish instead of the French. <laughs> and so from 1970, 1997 on, I started reconstructing my Spanish which has improved. I can now preach in Spanish. and pre I've actually been the Spanish priest in an Anglo parish. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Diocese of Lubbock did not work out as well, and uh, Bishop Alvaro Corrada of Tyler, Texas took my case in 2002. It took three and a half years to get permission from the Vatican. I had my licentiate, my basic educational formation you know, done. Uh, and so I started in 2005 as a formal seminarian. He asked his canon lawyer, how quickly can I ordain this man? <laughs> and he laid it out, each of the steps, which was two years. And I had a wonderful time in that formation with Father Luis Larrea at the largest Hispanic church in our diocese, where I was practicing my Spanish and working and learning. Uh, ordained as a deacon in that church and then ordained as a priest in uh, September 1st of 2007. So I'm almost 10 years as a Catholic priest, having more fun than a human being ought to have. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did Pat ever imagine herself being the wife of a Catholic priest? Uh, I think my wife was hoping that that would happen for a long time. Okay. She had to pray for me more years than Monica prayed for St. Augustine. <laughs> and it was a diff there were some difficult things in the journey, but she really hoped I would become that, and she is almost a perfect enabler. Well, she was a very good Presbyterian minister's wife. Yeah. And she's just very supportive, but always clarifying things. And she's also just very supportive. Now we're old enough that she's retired. She takes care of family, she takes care of me. <laughs> allows me to work a 55 to 65 hour week in the priesthood. And we have an absolutely wonderful relationship, married 46 years. Um, all right, a couple questions then about your journey, Paul, because I know some details. I, I usually don't know the journey of my guests <laughs> yeah. until I hear it. <clears throat> you yeah. and I have known each other for a long time. But something that fascinates me about your background um, that you didn't mention here is that when you, I, I don't know where this came about in your old childhood formation, because you were brought up as a PK, mm -hmm. a PK, a yeah. pastor's kid, and your right. dad was a pastor for until he was in his 80s, you yep. said. Mm -hmm. But you also admitted to me that by the time you went to seminary, you didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. I mean, so the issue is you're, you're being, you're called to be a minister, yep. but yet you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. And I've often thought when, when I've gone through spiritual battles and I've, and I've wondered about faith and all the other issues, mm -hmm. the one thing that keeps me going mm -hmm. is he's, he's risen. That's the one thing, and that's the one thing you didn't believe. Well, I didn't believe in anything supernatural. Okay. I was almost a perfectly Kantian moral minister where we believe that religion is necessary, and somehow I knew I wanted to deal with the deepest level of people. And I knew to deal with the deepest level of people, I needed to deal with the spiritual level. I didn't really know what that meant. Yeah. And you so, had not heard it? Brought uh, up? Oh, Marcus, I heard all the words. Okay. I heard all the words from the Bible. 
but I was brought up in a scientific context from my high school, Midland, Michigan, home of Dow Chemical Company. Yep, been there many times. Okay, I was the top <laughs> science student out of that high school that year. And I, I saw myself as intellectual and scientific, ignoring all the evidence for the supernatural. Okay. And so I've been on a constant journey looking for evidences that the biblical message is really real. I could give a lot of examples. But I've been keeping, kept looking at that. I even in the time when I was, between the time Bishop Corrada said he'd take me as a priest, but he said, I don't have a job for you. <laughs> I'd get a job, so I ended up teaching chemistry and physics at a local high school, which was perfect preparation to think through this yeah. you know, science and faith issue. And I now have a uh, two-sided, one-page summary, bibliography of five different areas of evidences for the supernatural. Because uh, I've served as six years in campus ministry, and we know the problems we're having losing our kids when they leave the parish, losing, right. losing maybe 80% of our kids in college. I think we've got to do some really hard intellectual work talking about the real evidences for the supernatural, which I've got a lot of ammunition now. Yeah. Um, for you, was it, a, was it an intellectual turn or was it a grace turn that brought you to, on your knees no, no, to believe I'm, in the resurrection? No, of I'm, Jesus? I'm a bit of an intellectual pointy headed guy. And for me, it was, it was a lot, it, it had to make sense rationally. It had to make sense consistently. It had to make sense scientifically. Like for example, I like Lee Strobel's book, The Case for a Creator, hmm. where he, inter he works in six different technical scientific areas interviews Nobel Prize laureates who say this cannot have happened without intelligent design. Yep. Plus there are miracles, there's all kinds of things. Like Padre Pio, yep. healing Gemma, can't remember her last name, who didn't have pupils in her eyes. And the 20th century doctors said she will never see. But after Padre Pio prayed over her, heard her first confession, gave her communion, she developed sight to the point she could read a telephone directory and went to school. <laughs> but she never got pupils in her eyes and the doctors just flat out said this is impossible. Which is of course the reason that was one of the two miracles right. for his canonization. Right. But there's a lot of proof like that. I think we've got a lot of intellectual work to do to explain how and why our faith makes sense. You know what um, John Paul II did in that encyclical on faith and reason, uh, I think is to me, that's hard to read, yeah. but it's very profound, and there should be no inherent conflict between the two, but we need to make that case, and especially with our young people. Would you say also another problem that led to, um, not that led to your problem, but that in terms of the resurrection, but mm -hmm. also brought you to an acceptance of it, was the issue of authority. I mean, before, as a Presbyterian, you got the Bible, but how you interpret mm -hmm. that passage or not is all over the place. I remember yeah. when I was a Presbyterian <clears throat> pastor, sadly, they had done a survey amongst Presbyterian pastors, mm -hmm. and only about 80% of them believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which blew me away. Yeah. Why be a pastor if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus yeah. Christ? Because then nothing supernatural of heaven and hell is real. Yep. Now, but for me, it was an intellectual journey. Okay. I think St. Thomas Aquinas said, the argument from authority is the weakest of arguments. Yep. And so we had a professor at uh, McCormick Theological Seminary, Dr. R.G. Hamilton Kelly, uh, South African Methodist, who was an Oxford scholar. And because I didn't believe in the resurrection, my wife and a group of students negotiated a class on the resurrection. <laughs> and I asked him the hardest questions I could, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, for an entire semester, and he won. <laughs> and I just, I had to say this, this, the evidence is there, this makes sense, and I'm really foolish if I don't admit it. Now that was primary, I think, now maybe it was, it was certainly grace inspired, right. but for me the way I think, it's gotta make sense. Well, for me, another issue that helped me when I'd go through a rough time spiritually, mm -hmm. uh, and being attacked by doubts. Mm -hmm. Another issue on the resurrection was the witness of the of the martyrs, mm -hmm. the martyred apostles, mm -hmm. who would die for a lie. That's was, right. Was exactly. that an important part of your... Yeah, because when I got into the Catholic Church, I had to study philosophy, which I did not anticipate liking, but it was tremendously powerful. Mm -hmm. And men like Friedrich Hegel and his descendants argued that the resurrection was something invented by a neurotically distressed group of apostles. 
I don't think that number of people die that kind of a suffering death for something made up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the book, Who Moved the Stone? Uh, yeah, that's very, Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morrison, I think. Yep, yeah, right. Uh, and that's another one where you can see the interior logic of his reasoning making sense. And then if you want to reject it, you have to contradict his reason. Right. That's and, right. And mm. it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, scripture talks about uh, uh, us being comforted that we might comfort mm -hmm. in uh, Second Corinthians. Mm -hmm. And when you look back on your own journey, do you see that as God maybe allowing you to have that time of your life doubting the resurrection, fighting these battles, particularly to prepare you mm -hmm. as a leader and a teacher mm -hmm. for the age that we're in now. Yeah. Oh, I would have to share with you, I'm just amazed. Everything from my choice to go to Venezuela where I learned Spanish, to all of the intellectual things that I fought through, every single thing that I did, including the linguistic training to teach English, has had an effect on my effectivity in preaching and teaching and being an effective uh, priest. Now, it wasn't always clear that that's what was going on. <laughs> right, right. Sometimes I was really frustrated, <laughs> like, God, what am I going to become? <laughs> but every single thing has fit together, and in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of others, has helped me to become a deeper, more effective priest, especially in terms of teaching, but also in terms of understanding people. I, I, think, I think I'm fairly soft-hearted pastorally. <laughs> uh, marriage, children, concerns for children, especially our older children who don't have yeah. faith. Yeah. Very sad situation. I really like trying to reach out to those people, to those kids, and understand what happened and then make sense out of what is really true. Yeah. Um, when I, th again, think about our background, uh, I've been thinking some things to ask you for, mm -hmm. for the sake of our audience, and, yeah. and one of them is that <clears throat> you've come a long way You've never given up your love for Scripture. Nope. I know you, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, but understanding it and applying it changes, partially because of authority, mm -hmm. you know, how we interpret things, but also yeah. coming to a different understanding of, of Scripture. And I, I was thinking of asking a couple topics, but, uh, and then get your reflection on them. And I, I didn't tell you which ones I was going to dump on you. That's okay. I, I, I'm ready for anything. Okay, my I friend. <laughs> because one particular verse which we understand at mm -hmm. least slightly differently as Catholics from mm -hmm. our old Presbyterian backgrounds is Ephesians 2.8. Mm -hmm. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, mm -hmm. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk. Mm -hmm. I went a little bit beyond. But talk a bit about how we understood or you understood that passage back in the McCormick days. Well, back in those days as a pastor. And then uh, how you. Well, it was even more difficult after I became evangelical in 79. I did, wasn't so concerned about that before, but when I actually embraced evangelicalism, the problem was my friends all said, you're just saved by faith alone. Uh, but I couldn't find that. Now, if we look at the word faith, to be faithful in Greek, it's pisteoin eis. And if you look at that Greek construction, it has a strange preposition at the end. Hmm. And the King James Version of the Bible translated it as to believe upon, because the translators knew that that structure in Greek had a moral context. It's not just intellectual, not just the Greek intellectual context, but it had a moral context. Hmm. So even to say to believe, if I'm going to believe, it's not just intellectual knowledge, but it is then trusting obedience. And that great Protestant hymn, Trust and Obey, right. they got it right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I could, I just have a whole set of things. I've written a couple of books and a number of papers on this. In the Catholic understanding, we are saved by grace, in a sense, by grace first or grace alone. But once we've been given the gift, we must respond. Yeah. It's like the parable of the talents. Those servants could never have gotten that money by themselves, but once they were graced by the king, mm -hmm. then they had to do something with it. And so we're required to respond to that grace and do something. It's like the parable of the vine and the branches in John 15. If you don't bear fruit, you cut off and burn in the fire. 
or at the end of Matthew, in the end of the uh, uh, Beatitudes, the difference between building your house on the rock and building your house on the sand. Oh, what's the difference? And I ask many people that question. Nobody knows the difference. <laughs> because Jesus says, if you hear my words and do not obey them, that's building your house on the sand. If you hear my words and obey them, you're building your house on the rock. So trust and obey. Faith without works is dead. And all of a sudden, all those things kind of came together. Mm. I could give you 20 passages that illustrate that. And it's and that's included in there. That's right. We're saved by faith through, mm -hmm. by grace through faith. Because, <clears throat> yeah, it isn't merely intellectual mm -hmm. affirmation that there's a God, because the devil says the same that's thing. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, in fact, I, I don't remember seeing this as a Protestant. I wish, I don't know why I didn't, but because of my tradition, mm -hmm. we would emphasize the, the text that said Abraham uh, was credited as righteous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the reason he was credited as righteous was because when he heard the call of God to leave Ur, he left. He obeyed. He obeyed. That's right. So and the obedience, the, the act of obedience was right. an essential part of his faith. Now, I looked up at one point, I was concerned about the Holy Spirit, because we're today preoccupied with freedom. Yeah. And sometimes I watch the halftime at the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. As I remember, it was in 1989 when the switch came to almost a complete preoccupation with freedom. So I did a study in the use of freedom and obedience in the Bible. Obedience shows up five times more than freedom. And our salvation is dependent on our obedience to the law of God, which he makes possible by his grace. If I argued that I can do it on my own, I'd be Pelagian. That's a heresy. Yeah. And so I have, to, I have to admit, and God, I look at my life, oh my goodness, God protected me, God has looked over me, God gave me the right wife, God kept me from doing certain, I mean, it's been by grace, but then every time I've been able to respond with that opportunity that he gave, and it's been a blessing. That makes sense? Yeah. Works, it, faith and works? Yeah, and, and there's, mm -hmm. again, it, the, the division that came over how we understand justification mm -hmm. and, and its relationship to works came at a time when we yeah. had great division and mm -hmm. battles were going on. Yeah. People were forced into corners like yep. in a boxing match. Mm -hmm. Rather than understanding that from a Catholic perspective, we are saved by grace. Yeah. The, the fact that we even respond is a gift of grace. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then even our obedience is because we can do nothing apart from Christ, God so we're, enables it. we're enable it. But yep. it's still, there's always the mystery mm -hmm. of that freedom. And what's your thoughts on this, Paul? It seems to me that when the battles rage over these issues, it's because we get caught up in either or. It's either mm -hmm. this or it's that. It's either mm -hmm. the sovereignty of God or the freedom of man, yep. or it's grace through faith alone, and no, where in fact, Catholic theology has always been kind of this mystery of the both yep. and. Mm -hmm. The yeah, uniqueness it, of the both ends. Well, in certain areas, and I think we have to go back. First of all, when we studied, when I was at Franciscan University and we studied the document from uh, Vatican II, Dei Verbum, yeah. I just studied that and I said, holy Toledo, this is just really right. Because you have it's a triangle. Word of God, the tradition, and the magisterium. And I can give you the citations out of scripture for all of those. Yeah. I just thought that was amazing. And what, one of the things that happened, I was in a class there, Scott Hahn. Yeah. The day when we were supposed to study Dei Verbum, something had happened, he didn't show up. And I dared to stand up and lead the class for 50 minutes. Because <laughs> I, I mean, you're not gonna take Hahn's place, okay? I couldn't stand not to study that thing. Because <laughs> it shows the correct balance between those three pillars, which are biblical. Yeah, it may I was have been, so embarrassed to find that out. I, was, I can't remember <laughs> if it was Fulton Sheen or someone said that if Dei Verbum had been released during the Reformation, there would have been no Reformation. That's right, I think so. And it, it's so sad because in the Reformation, things got polarized, they got nationalized, they got caught up in wars. And actually, if you look at the, the, the activity of the Council of Trent, the fathers of the Council of Trent really tried to take into account all the criticisms of the church that were brought up, because there were a lot of problems in the Catholic Church. But they couldn't dialogue together, mostly because the Protestants were afraid of even ha either having their heads chopped off or being burned at the stake. That makes dialogue really hard. <laughs> but the Catholic Church really took a lot of that into account. And it was very interesting because the father of the institute where I was, Father Albert Chapelle, 
said that the true dialogue between Luther and the Catholic Church did not occur until the Second Vatican Council. And I think that's really true. And as you know, during the Second Vatican Council, a lot of people came over from the Faith and Order Conference, which I think was in Canada, and then hung around a lot of time on the outside edge of the Second Vatican Council. A lot of dialogue occurred, and a very healthy kind of thing happened, I think. Yep. <clears throat> from the non-Catholic perspective, you have a, a fair high percentage of folk that want to emphasize grace and faith alone, mm -hmm. and often uncomfortable with how to fit works into mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, the necessity of that. I remember when mm -hmm. I was a pastor, wasn't always sure what to do with the Sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. and how to interpret That's that. Right. Mm -hmm. As a priest, in the Catholic perspective, do you see kind of the opposite in your experience where you have a lot of Catholics that are more emphasized on, well, I, I was baptized, I was catechized, I go to Mass, I'm a mm -hmm. pretty good guy. Yeah. But what about the content of, of the faith? and? and the place of grace in their life and, and uh, surrendering themselves yeah. to Jesus Christ. If one focuses just on what I do, that can become an ego trip or kind of arrogance. To admit that I need God and I need God's help and I need God's forgiveness, especially in the sacrament of reconciliation, uh, that requires humility. Uh, I think the Catholic Church sometimes if you're not well instructed, can fall into thinking, I can do it. But it is true that we need to do things, but we really have to admit the role of grace and the Holy Spirit yeah. in our lives. Um, let me just say a word about that, because as I studied the sacrament of reconciliation, I, I, I looked at that really closely. I also found a document, I think it was Pope Pius XII, 1943, uh, mm -hmm. on the church, where he talked about, uh, he gave about eight benefits of going through the sa Sacrament of Reconciliation. And I had studied that. I was teaching a class of confirmation kids, 70 Hispanic kids in this church, teaching <laughs> them in English, trying to convince them that you really do want to go to reconciliation. <laughs> and as I thought through it, I had down this side, and I have eight steps, not just five or six, to a good reconciliation. 17 benefits down this side, spiritual, psychological, practical benefits, that if you do these steps right, tremendous rewards here. And so I am consistently trying to make the case to Catholic adults and to young people that the sacrament of reconciliation, see that, I have yeah. to admit I need God's help yeah. in the sacrament of reconciliation. And yet I then make promises, especially in penance and in repentance. See, Acts 26.20, where St. Paul is now a prisoner, he's before King Agrippa, he's going to be sent to Rome, he summarizes the faith by saying, I preach to them to repent, to turn to God, and present continuous tense, do deeds worthy of repentance. He didn't say anything about faith there at all, probably because faith leads us to obey God and want to conform ourselves to the holiness of God, therefore we want to repent. But you put that together you know, with the faith, and we're called on to repent us to change our mind, to turn to God, epistrepho means to change our lives, and to do deeds worthy of repentance, present continuous means to be habitually involved to virtue. Hmm. What a way to go. Right. <laughs> that, that would be contained under the fruit that our Lord talks yeah. about in John 15. But you see why I'm so excited about being Catholic. Right. It just fits together. Well, we're okay. going to pause there, Paul. We'll come back <laughs> in just a little bit. And uh, our guest is Father Paul Key former Presbyterian minister, and we'll come back just a moment with some more questions about his journey. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Uh, I'm Marcus Grote, I your host, and our guest tonight is Father Paul Keyes, an old friend of mine, a former Presbyterian minister. And I'd like to grill him on a few other scriptures, because what I'm interested in is sharing with the audience, mm -hmm. in a way, your journey of your thought on certain issues mm -hmm. related to scripture, because as a <clears throat> Presbyterian pastor, scripture is infallible. Mm -hmm. uh, although I'm not sure that all Presbyterians have the same view of Scripture, right? Well, what you I know, across the board yeah, of Presbyterianism. Historically, historically, Presbyterianism was pretty responsible to Scripture. Uh, 
but in the modern church, I think they, we had lost both a reliance on Scripture and a reliance on the Book of Confessions, and have kind of fallen into modern psychological and moral behavior that fits that of the world, which is why I, I felt I needed to change, and I was either going to go evangelical or Catholic, and yeah. I found Catholic to be more true. Well, again, reading Scripture. I remember reading um, <clears throat> in a variety of history books mm -hmm. from the late 1800s that there were an awful lot of fairly well-informed Catholics and non-Catholics that thought mm -hmm. Protestantism was on its deathbed at the end of the 1800s, really? mm -hmm. the end of the 19th century, uh, because of what mm -hmm. the falling out of Scripture and mm -hmm. uh, the higher criticism that had undercut. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't have a church as your authority, and you don't have tradition to fall back yeah. on, you've got the Bible alone, and then if you don't trust the Bible anymore, what do you got left? And then in the 20th century, you have rebirth at Princeton, mm -hmm. uh, evangelicalism, fundamentalism, mm -hmm. and a whole rebirth of Protestantism yeah. turns around. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that had to do with scripture. Yeah. But, but our separated brethren still struggle with those remnants of how do you understand scripture? Mm -hmm. How do you understand Jesus? They don't all have the same view of Christ or the yeah. Trinity, yeah. right? That's all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, you and I dealt with. But a couple questions then from Scripture that I'd like to, you, you to talk about. One, you were talking about confession. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be good to just refer to two Scriptures that I wanted you to mm -hmm. reflect on, on how you understood them then and how you've come to understand them now. Uh, maybe the most clear is 1 John 1, 1.9, if we mm -hmm. confess our sins, He is faithful and just mm -hmm. and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sure. Well. In a Protestant mindset, I just assume you confess them to God, ignoring John 20, 19 through 23. And this, this I kept from coming across these passages that, you know, and having a Catholic wife who was really well informed, she kind of helped keep my feet to the fire. <laughs> but we just read that, and, you know, the first time Jesus appears to the disciples, first resurrection appearance. In John 20, he breathes on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the consequence? The first consequence of receiving the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, and those that you do not remit are not remitted. Yeah. That sounds to me like God himself is delegating the power to the apostles to forgive sins. And my evangelical friends would make so much mileage out of, you don't have to confess your sins to a priest. But then why did Jesus delegate that? And then there's a matter of judgment there. Those whose sins you remit uh, yeah. are remitted. And though, so that implies that the priest has to make a judgment. And I understand that to mean if a person is not really repentant and has no intention of changing, I cannot give absolution. And only occasionally if I had to make that clear. I've had a few cases where I give a blessing and ask for the Holy Spirit to help this person. <laughs> but um, there were just a number of places like well, in this, in this case, and I use that passage to encourage people too, because the verse before that is, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and we are strangers to the truth. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Now that takes us beyond Luther, doesn't it? Yeah. He will not only forgive us our sins, which is to look upon us like we're covered with snow, and cleanse us from every kind of wrong, which implies change. Oh, that's what repentance is about, isn't it? <laughs> And so, for example, I've, I've had a very good response to myself as a confessor. When I was first ordained, I was in this Hispanic church, and I started out hearing confessions one hour a week, and it very quickly grew to eight to ten hours a week. And I listened to people, and then we try to decide what's the most important area where change needs to be made. We talk about how to... There's a little bit of spiritual direction because there's supposed to be healing going on in confession. Mm -hmm. It's not just confession. It's also repentance, and it's restoration, maybe satisfaction. And so I usually take a little bit longer in confession. I've got little handouts that I give as I found different things, because I can't talk about enough things. Yeah. So depending on the sin, I pull into my bag, <laughs> and I'm known as the priest who gives homework at confession. <laughs> well, if someone comes in to the confessional <clears throat> and, their, and their life is heading in this direction, mm -hmm. and it ought to be heading in that direction, mm -hmm. and they by grace, are moved to confess yeah. 
I'm in this direction, mm -hmm. that a part of the confessional is to nidge him in this direction, mm -hmm. not, not just forgive here, but to nidge him. That's right. In and the, sometimes to give hope. Yeah. That's, I like to, I think this is a powerful thing for any priest to do, but to counsel from the Bible. And if I quote that from the Bible, that's what God says, that he will forgive and he will yeah. cleanse. And that, then they think they've got to argue with God, not just with me. And he promises that, then it's my job and the job of the church to give the support to that person, even though imperfect, to take the steps to help be purified and cleansed. Yeah, for me, what I came to recognize, even though this was one of my favorite yep. verses as a, <clears throat> as a pastor, but I began to recognize the danger of individualism in the Bible, mm -hmm. Jesus and me, Mm -hmm. uh, as long as I've got Jesus, as long as I have faith in my Lord, what church I belong to doesn't mm -hmm. matter, as long as I've got Christ in scriptures. If we just take this verse, if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. let's just stop there. Mm -hmm. I've done something wrong. Well, how do I know it's wrong? And how do I know in which way it's wrong? Mm -hmm. Right, yep. and, and all this. And okay, I, I, do I need to confess that to God? Does it make a difference? Do I need to, to any kind of restitution with anyone? Or does it end there? Is it more to that? And our Lord in his love for us gave us mm -hmm. the church mm -hmm. so that we could know through his Holy Spirit right. what is sin, mm -hmm. the, the, ex, the extent of that sin, mm -hmm. how much it damages my life, how much it damages somebody else, and how I can rid from that, mm -hmm. turn in the right direction, so it isn't just up to me to decide that. Well, let me add something more to that. Cause yeah. I, I just I keep finding, in that little booklet that you published a long time ago, I think it's out of print, 95 Reasons for Becoming oh, a Remaining the, Catholic. Your little collection. I put a whole lot of things together. I'm, I think this is in it. Because in confession, for me to know things, uh, if you've studied psychology, and I got this in uh, clinical pastoral education, 19 forms of psychological defense mechanisms denial, rationalization, projection, all those kinds of things. We have a whole army of psychological manipulations that we use to protect ourselves. Yeah. How do I even dare to think I can be honest without help? And a number of nationally known psychologists and psychiatrists have documented that on average, Catholics are more stable and more healthy than our other people, mostly because of that practice of confession and the way in which they get guidance and are open to receiving that. So to me, I get really excited about confession and I, I hand out these sheets yeah. and I talk to the kids and I want to convince them this, this is a smart way to go. Yeah. I mean, if we're you're looking at that verse and you're yep. wondering, well, <clears throat> is, is contraception a sin? And who am I going to listen to? That's right. Well, you've got churches on every block in a city that have different opinions on whether it's right or wrong, whether they need to do or not. I even remember when I was in seminary, there was a book going around encouraging us to not only use, but to promote contraception as a responsible way of controlling your family until you're ready. Let me respond to that. Yeah. Because sometimes we don't realize truth for quite a while. And I will admit, I, I, I understood clearly the teaching on abortion. Abortion is clearly evil. I did not understand, even after I was Catholic for a while, about contraception. Yeah. But if you look at what's going on in the world, see, uh, the guidelines of the church are not just for personal happiness and salvation. They are also for the salvation of the country, the nation, and the people of God. Yeah. Paul VI, when he issued that encyclical, was so, he saw things, or the church saw things. And Carol Wojtyla, who sent him document on that from uh, Krakow, mm -hmm. saw that. Now we're seeing the death of Europe because we're contracepting ourselves into oblivion. We no longer have the workers to work. Thank God in this country, the immigrants are mostly Hispanic, and if they're not Catholic, they're Baptist, <laughs> which means they're Christian. Yeah. Most of the immigrants into Europe are Muslims, whose goal it is to conquer us. And we are committing sociological death in rebelling against the teaching of the church because we want to embrace contraception and all of the different evils that brings. And so I, I just sit back now and I say, holy Toledo, how did the Pope know that? Maybe he was inspired. <laughs> of course, now the biggest virtue is, is um, to be tolerant. I don't want to be intolerant. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. Let so. me make a comment to that because Bishop <laughs> Corrada, who took my case, good Jesuit, 
One time I was sitting with him and he said, you know, tolerance is not a Christian virtue. Tolerance is a civic virtue. Hmm. Tolerance is not a Christian virtue. We're not called on to tolerate evil. We're called on <coughs> Excuse to, me. Uh, yeah, we're called on to oppose evil. And we haven't done a very good job of that. Yeah. Yeah. Get you into conflict. We have an email. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a yeah. bug in my throat. From Noah from Philadelphia, and he writes. I've been a Catholic for a few years now and am continually exploring the vastness of our faith and the deep spirituality it offers. I have been convicted lately in my prayer time that my spiritual life needs to go deeper and I need to be better at rooting out habitual sins. I do go to confession pretty regularly, but am desiring to grow in holiness and leave behind the old sinful man. Does Father know of any concrete steps or practices I could incorporate into my life to help me move forward in my Christian walk. Specifically two things. Uh, Matthew Kelly in his books is very helpful. And in his book, Four Signs of a Dynamic Catholic, uh, the second chapter is study. Mm -hmm. And study is study to get a correct world view, which means getting God's perspective on things. So one way is to do spiritual reading, of which the Matthew Kelly books I think are very helpful. The other thing I think one needs to do, because everybody's in a little bit different situation spiritually, uh, Noah needs to find, and he's got to go looking for the right priest or the right spiritual director who can understand where he's coming from, what his needs are, and to give helpful suggestions. Mostly, frequently, we cannot see clearly what we need to do when we're under pressure. And if he can find a spiritual master, somebody who really is more mature, more deep, more widely read, and find somebody he can dialogue with, and then find the things to read, and then the things to practice, and the things to do. And that's, that's really quite possible to do. It, it seems to me important to, to trust our church. Mm -hmm. It can be very easy <clears throat> today to have a critical spirit, and especially in a cult country that we live in, to think mm -hmm. that we kind of know it better. But it's important to trust that the Holy Spirit is guiding the church. And mm -hmm. so when I think about reading for our folk, how do I mm -hmm. grow? I would like to encourage anyone that wants to grow to reflect deeply on the mass readings of every day. Mm -hmm. Like for today, where should I begin in right. all the books? Mm -hmm. Begin with the, the readings our church has chosen mm -hmm. for us today and reflect mm -hmm. deeply on that, mm -hmm. that gospel, even that psalm, mm -hmm. that reading from an epistle or an Old Testament. Begin there mm -hmm. as a start and then go out from there. But I, I would say that, that beginning with the scripture that our church mm -hmm. has given, everyone in the world has a verse they should reflect on. It's well, the readings of the Mass for today. Well, that's right. I think it's really valuable. And there are different ways to get the readings for the Mass. It, that is one set of reading that everybody can do. Yeah. Now, we use in our parish a series, The Word Amongst Us, The Word Among Us. And that also has a page of commentary yeah. on each one, which I think is pretty solid. You want to make sure that you have books that are approved by the church. There's also an attitude, St. Augustine, uh, he rebelled against the Christian faith. He thought it was too simple. He didn't think it was sophisticated enough. He finally came back in his confessions and he said, Lord, help me ask what this means. And Father Albert Chapelle, my last year in Belgium, because he knew I was a convert, he said, why don't you come in for an hour a week? And you ask me every hard question you can. And he taught me we need to ask the question, what does the church mean by what she teaches? Because you have to understand the words, you have to understand the context. You really need somebody wiser than yourself. And here I had a top level guy in the entire church giving me an hour a week for an entire nine months. And I asked every question I could and he just showed how that made sense. And so I think we, we have to have the confidence in the church to say, now, what is the church really trying to say by this? Because the church qualifies itself very carefully. And it's easy to misunderstand or take to, a, which a lot of Protestants don't know how to do that. And so I am much more patient now 
and especially after reflecting on Humanae Vitae and how accurate Paul VI <laughs> was, I want to be very cautious about questioning certain things. Uh, we could go deeper into that, but I think one needs to find authentically approved materials, because the scripture itself is not easy to understand correctly. Right. Find somebody who you can ask the questions to who's got systematic theological training, so they know at least the common pitfalls. Uh, the fellowship of the community of the church is just so important, you know? Well, all you have to do is look around in any city and see all the different churches that yeah. can't seem to get together <clears throat> and recognize mm -hmm. that, that the, the scriptures, which are an inspired part of mm -hmm. tradition, mm -hmm. were never intended to be alone. That's right. And when they're alone, they can inspire us to holy lives, mm -hmm. but we're, we're always set with conundrums. That's right. Uh, because of the application of different scripture. Yep. In fact, we have an email from Donald, who is a good example of a scripture. How do we apply this, given mm -hmm. other things we've talked about? And mm -hmm. Donald writes, John 1.29 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming to him, and he saith, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who taketh away the sin of the world, end of quote. And then Donald asks, since Jesus has taken away the sin of the world, paid the penalty of our sin by dying on the cross, <laughs> why the private confession to a priest and why do a penance? Well, the goal is repentance. And Jesus has taken away the sins of the world. We also have to ask the question, how does this get applied to individuals? Because it is very clear, universalism is a heresy. If you just said that Jesus died for the sins of the world, and he clearly, successfully died and atoned for the sins of the world, then you could, well, then I don't have to worry because he died for my sins. That's clearly not what scripture says, and that's not the tradition of the church. Well, again, then I don't, I'm not 100% sure where Donald's coming from mm -hmm. in terms of, but it's a good question. Sure. Because you can take that verse and say, well, geez, what about what this church believes or this? If he's taken away all the sins, uh, mm -hmm. all have been redeemed. But we take another scripture, okay, if that is mm -hmm. simply all that is true, Christ died and now mm -hmm. sin isn't the issue. In fact, I remember once, uh, a fairly liberal Protestant theologian giving a lecture on how evangelization has nothing to do with sin because we've been forgiven our sins. And evangelization is about telling people that God loves them who don't know it. That's all evangelization is. However, realizing what is already true. Yeah, right. Another but, heresy. So if it's true, if that verse stands alone, then when Peter gives his first sermon, his very first sermon after the death and resurrection of our Lord, he gives his first sermon and 5,000 guys ask the question, oh, what do, what we, do we do now? That's right. What's his answer? Repent and be baptized. That's exactly the point. Well, what are Jesus' first words out of his mouth in Mark 1, 14 through 15? Repent and believe the good news of the gospel. Yep. Now, why do I have to repent? Oh, that's part of the plan of salvation because I have to do certain things to be right with God. He makes it possible, Jesus died for my sins, but to have that applied to me and to be effective for salvation, let's see what the Bible says about what I have to do. Which is why in that passage of Acts 26, 20, I think Paul comes down three times with repent. Yeah. It's, it isn't a faith alone. That's right. It's a repent. And if you take the whole book of Ephesians, <clears throat> the first mm -hmm. three chapters of Ephesians are essentially about what happens when you're baptized mm -hmm. and how it changes you, makes mm -hmm. you a member of the body, a mystical mm -hmm. body. Yep. And then this, <clears throat> the second set of chapters, four, five, and six, are about what? How to live that out. In the church. How to be right. different, mm -hmm. how to change, yep. how to put the old yep. and on the new. And yep. so the necessity of that, you use the example of the, of the parable of the talents, mm -hmm. where the king gives... <clears throat> gives yep. Yep. They don't just stop there. But they have to respond or they will be cast into hell. Oh, we don't talk about that very much, do we? We've got five minutes left, Father Paul. <laughs> um, let's see, how much, we've got a gazillion things you and I could talk on forever. Our Lady. Talk about the transition of Our Lady, if you would. Well, I just had a very hard time with that. And it was both on an intellectual and an emotional level. And I intellectually understood the correct teaching on Our Lady and just found it very difficult to pray the rosary. So I knew what it says about vain repetition did not apply to that because you can read that very clearly what that replies to. 
Um, I now find myself closing prayers a lot, invoking the presence of Our Lady because she is our mother. She is very sympathetic. She can be very comforting. And even when that little boy, uh, Colton Burpo, went to heaven, didn't make it into the movie, <laughs> Protestant <laughs> minister, father. But in the book, they, people ask him, did you see Mary? And he said, yes, she was there interceding before the father and with her son. And I mean, interesting non-biblical witness. Right. But the Blessed Virgin is our mother. She was assumed into heaven and is there as the saints do intercede for us as part of the fellowship of the church. I wonder, same thing for me too, that mm -hmm. part of the problem with understanding the whole <clears throat> devotion to Our Lady, because mm -hmm. the whole idea of talking to somebody mm -hmm. else other than our Lord Jesus mm -hmm. was tough. Wasn't yeah. a part of our tradition. That's right. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so really before understanding devotion to Mary, we had to mm -hmm. understand the communion of saints yeah. in a way which really wasn't a part of our background. Yeah. Well, William Barclay in his commentary on Revelation, it's right around Revelation 5.8, we're talking about the elders offering up the, 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 the incense to the Ancient of Days. And the angels were assumed, it was assumed that angels carried our prayers from heaven to the saints to be offered to God. And good Presbyterian scholar William Barclay points that out. That was the tradition at that time. So maybe we've lost something out of the tradition. Yeah, well, there's, there's a bunch that, I mean, uh, Luther and Calvin both had devotions to Mary, mm -hmm. but the Lutherans and the Calvinists That's later, right. two, three, four generations, yeah. kind of let that stuff go because yeah. it's too Catholic. Yeah. That's right. What about, one other question, my friend, um, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of being divinized. That wasn't something we talked much as, uh, as Protestants. In other words, yeah. being recreated and we experience the d divine nature of Christ mm -hmm. we receive through the mm -hmm. sacraments. Talk real quickly about yeah. that. Well, that's a, that's a tricky subject because Scientology says we'll become gods. Right, as do the Mormons. Yeah, and the issue, uh, how does becoming divinized, what does that really mean in the Christian economy of salvation? And I've not done a lot of study on that, but it appears to me that that means we need to become holy, as God is holy. Uh, in this life, we need to come closer to God so that when we go to heaven to be with God, we never become God, but we're there in union with Him. Now that's the way I would understand that. Well, this, this idea of He and me and mm -hmm. I and Him, yeah. the, the, the abiding of Christ in mm -hmm. our hearts, the indwelling of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, grace yeah. is interpreted, grace itself is interpreted mm -hmm. as divine life. And so we have this mysterious sharing. The power of God within us. Uh, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Part, right, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a thing that, again, when we think about Bible alone, how do we take those verses? So we need mm -hmm. the church that our Lord gave us out of his love for us yep. to know how we apply mm -hmm. that and live it out That's right. in the tradition yeah. of that. I'd love to ask you as we close, my friend, let's say you've got a Presbyterian watching real quickly out mm -hmm. there. Why should he come home to the church? Well, if one wants to be where there is truth and accurate biblical teaching, intellectual foundations, the Eucharist, which is Jesus Christ sacrificed and resurrected in which we participate with him. Uh, there's just a whole, there's a whole series of things that have their completion or their fullness in the Catholic Church. I think when people come home to the Catholic Church, they need to make sure they come home to the real Catholic Church. Because you have some people either liberalized or they've lost their faith. There's some strange things happening in the Catholic Church. So you want to make sure you're coming back yeah. to the real church, yeah. which means we're coming back to the scripture, to the tradition, and to that which is really true. I think of Robert Schuller making sure that the Crystal Cathedral got sold to the Catholic diocese. There were other buyers. <laughs> and he said, I want to have this sold to the Catholic Church because I know their doctrine will not change. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things we want to do. We're not always the most effective in our ministry. Some of the evangelical churches are very effective in meeting people's needs. And that's, but I put my cards with where I thought truth was, so when I struggle and work to improve everything else, I'm doing it for the right place. And I would invite all Protestants to join us in helping to renew, build up, and be active in the Catholic Church, because that's finally the place where it all comes together. All right, my friend, could you briefly close us with a blessing? Sure, let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we're at a time of war. 
with the values of the world, with the values of sin, with evil spirits and devil, devils which prowl around. I pray that you would be upon everyone who's listening to this program, that you might come into their hearts, that you would give them the strength that they need to turn to you, and that you would bring your blessing upon them, heal them, guide them, and establish them. This we pray in Jesus' precious name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Paul. It's good to see you again, my friend. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. And thank you for joining us on this episode. I hope that Father Paul's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week. Mm -hmm.